Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet, they would not hearken unto their judges. Good morning. How are we doing? We're in the book of Judges, the seventh book of the Old Testament, right after Joshua, before Ruth. And uh, I'm going to ask you this. How many understand the words of that introduction? Because I have no idea what he's saying. i got to tell you that right now. They thought that was cool that brought that in there somehow, but uh, whatever. <laughs> Whatever is up with that, right? We're looking at, at these true stories in the book of Judges, and uh, some of these stories we're looking at, I shouldn't say some of them, many of them, really, it's like, what is up with that? What is going on? And, and we talked about Gideon last week, and we, he's more, you know, he's, he's more popular, famous, and Deborah, and uh, we're going to look at Samson in a couple weeks, but... Uh, Gideon last week, great true story, God anointed him and used him, and he did so well, but at the very end, it didn't end up so well. Really, at the very end, he created what he thought, I believe, was a memorial. Let's remember what the Lord has done, and it actually morphed into an idol, and they began to worship that, and they fell back again into their sin and idolatry. And so we come this morning to Judges chapter 10, and we're looking at someone that I've never in all these years preached a complete uh, sermon about because, and his name is Jephthah, Jephthah. It, it doesn't look like it's pronounced that way, but it's like Jeff, Jephthah, Jephthah. And let me tell you, this guy is messed up. He is. He, he is wrong. He is bad. He is ungodly, and he is twisted. I almost named the sermon the original twisted sister. I really did. I thought about that. And, but what's happened with this broken hero in, in the sense of a, a deliverer and, and a savior, imperfect, and he is greatly imperfect today. And so, uh, really, we look at this, and it's unsettling, and it's terrible what takes place, but there's some lessons that we can learn that I believe are very pertinent for us this morning. And, and so, really, uh, the title of this morning's message is Cheap Hot Dog Faith. Cheap Hot Dog Faith. It really is. And so, I want you to think about hot dogs for a minute. What's in, now I'm saying your average hot dog. Your average hot dog. We're, we're not talking about the Nathans. We're not talking about the 100% pure beef ones that I really like to eat. But just your average hot dog. And, and I should ask uh, Wolfie here, a member of the congregation, because uh, Wolfie is, is a butcher. But what's in here? And I'm going to try to get some of this right. But the compressed meat, compressed pig, and there's salt, and there's sodium nitrate, and sodium uh, nitrate and there's malodinitrin, and there's heterocyclic amine, and other various chemicals and color added to your average cheap hot dog. And studies show if you eat one of these hot dogs a day, your risk of cancer goes up about 8%. But we Americans love our hot dogs, so every 4th of July, we eat 150 million hot dogs on the 4th of July alone. So why am I talking about hot dogs here on a Sunday morning? Well, our main character, beside Jesus, who was always our main character, our main character, Jephthah, he's a lot like hot dogs and Americans who build their faith like that cheap hot dog. A little of this, a little of that, mix it in with a little bit of truth, and the result is a concoction that you can't call Christian. 
And it's more than bad for you, it becomes toxic. So we want to look at what does God's word have to say? A hundred percent pure gospel. Amen. Let's stand together if you would. Take your Bibles or your app there and we're going to go into the Word of God, we're going to learn some lessons, and then we're going to come and we're going to give thanks and worship the perfect, broken hero, Savior, Jesus Christ, in communion this morning. So if you would take your Bibles and let's say, you know, this is God's Word. I'm going to receive it and I'm going to allow Him to work in my life this morning. Let's say it together. This is my Bible. This is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. When I read and hear the word, faith comes to my spirit. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the word of God. I'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we have uh, the app, we have the notes, the outline there for you to follow along. And so we look at the back story. We're in Judges chapter 10, verse 6 through 16, and I, I am going to read this. So let's take a look, and we're going to get the, what is going on here? And so again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashereth and the gods of Aram, Sidon, Moan, Ammon, and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to the Philistines, the Ammonites, who began to oppress them that year. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River in the land of the Amorites, that is in the Gilead, that area of Gilead and the tribe of Gilead. The Ammonites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim, the Israelites we're in great distress. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, and the Philistines, the Sidonians, and the Amalekites, and the Mennonites? When they oppressed you, you cried out for me to help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods. So I will not rescue you any more. The first time God says, no, Uh uh-uh. Go and cry out to the God you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. He says, how about those small g gods, false gods that you've been running after and you've been worshiping instead of me? Why don't you ask them to help you and them to deliver you and them to rescue you and them to save you? But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, we have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside the foreign gods and served the Lord, and he was grieved by their misery. Grieved by their misery. What we see taking place here is several things. For the first time, In this whole story in Judges, we see the Lord says, you know what? Why don't you go ask the gods which you've been serving and going after that they would help you. And he says basically to them, you just want to be rescued. You're just praying a foxhole prayer. You just want to get out of your trouble. And I know none of us have ever prayed a prayer like that before. God, if you would help me now, if you help me now, I, I'm just going to be a good boy. I'm going to do so good. Uh, and I'm going to do this for you and this for you. And th- How many have ever said something like that? Come on, maybe not exactly, but, you know, you get the idea. And, and he said, no, you're not really repenting. And then finally, they repent and they turn. And do a 180, and their heart is in it, and they really seek the Lord and ask the Lord for help and deliverance. And what I see this morning, we're singing about it, but what really struck me this morning, and it hit my heart this morning in our worship time, our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. 
so faithful. I'm going to tell you, there's times that he shouldn't have been, and he doesn't have to be. There's times in my life that, God, you're so faithful. Forgive me for not recognizing your faithfulness and thanking you for your faithfulness. And, and this is what God is showing to his people Israel. They're crying out for deliverance, and he says, you know, try those false gods. But, you know, really they turn to him. And, and, and he, he says, you keep going ask after those gods and after those other gods and after those false gods and those idols. And, and we look at that, we say, well, you know, I have trouble kind of connecting with that, relating to that, because, you know, I don't worship an idol. But an idol is not just a statue. It's far more than a statue that we would buy down to. An idol is whatever we look to for answers, for comfort, for relief, for significance apart from God. And, and some of the things that we look to, they're okay with, within themselves, but some of them are not at all. And, and, and we look to them instead of God for the joy and the comfort and the significance, and they find out that they will enslave you, the things that we're going after. And that's what the Lord says to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 2, verse 13. And this is what we see taking place with Israel here and we see taking place in our lives sometimes, the things we keep going after. And I'm just going to find solace here. I'm just going to find relief here. I'm going to find comfort here. And God says, for my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cisterns, cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. And what this is, is a clear description of our sin. And sin is twofold. We reject God, and then in our sin, we replace God, and life becomes all about desperately digging another cistern, a new relationship, a new teaching, a, a new uh, uh, achievement, and it's knowledge and knowledge or another level of income that I just have to reach, a certain size even church or more and more and more, or I'm going to find fulfillment and satisfaction over there. I'm going to find it in him. I'm going to find it in her. Maybe I'm going to find it in this drink. I'm going to find it in this drug and Maybe in this video, and we dig, and we dig, and we dig a little deeper, and there's no permanent water. And we think there has to be permanent water somewhere. It has to be here. And finally, we get to the place, and we realize this is the wrong well that I've been digging in. How many know what I'm talking about? I just dig a little deeper. You know, the thing is, we get in sin, and we know we're in sin, and sometimes we run a little harder in that sin and after that sin, thinking we're going to get out of that sin, and we're enslaved by that sin, but we've just been digging in the wrong well. And I want to tell you this morning, if you've been digging in the wrong well and haven't found the water that satisfies you this morning, you can stop digging because the well is here, Jesus Christ. All you have to do is take a drink this morning. Come on. And you may not like this. This may not sound kosher, but I want to say it anyway. The drinks are on the house in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on. You haven't heard that in church before, have you? Come and drink from the river of life freely, freely. And so Israel prays this foxhole prayer, and, and God says, you really don't want me, and you just want help and deliverance. And finally, yes, we do, Lord, we need you. Oh, Lord, I need you. Oh, Lord, I need you. And so lessons we can learn from a twisted, broken, hot dog faith hero, Jephthah. Jephthah, number one, is a mighty rejected warrior. We look at this, rejected warrior. So let's take a look at the scripture here. Now Jephthah, chapter 11, of Gilead was a great warrior. He was the son of Gilead, but his mother was a prostitute. And Gilead's wife also had several sons. And when these half-brothers grew up, they chased Jephthah off the land. You'll not get any of our father's inheritance, they said, for you are the son of a prostitute. Same father, different mother. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Soon 
he had a band of worthless rebels following him. And about this time, the Ammonites began the war against Israel. When the Ammonites attacked, the elders of Gilead sent for Jephthah in the land of Tob. And the elders said, come and be our commander. Help us fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, aren't you the ones who hated me and drove me from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? Because we need you, the elders replied. If you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you ruler over all the people of Gilead. This is what we're going to do. So it's a little bit like, you know, crying out to God, we want to be delivered, we want help, but, 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 you see, he was a son of a prostitute, rejected by his half-brothers, driven out by his brothers, he flees to another land, and he becomes kind of like a crime boss. Man, he has some thugs and worthless men gather around him, and at this time, the evil tribe, the Ammonites, they make war against Israel. And, and the tribe of Gilead, of Israel, begins to beg him to return to be their commander and the ruler. And, and Jephthah responds a little bit like God did. You don't really want me. You just want to use me. But he agrees, and he goes back home to Israel, and, and he tries diplomacy with the king of the Ammonites, and that didn't work. And then we see they go to war, and it says in, in verse 29, 32, and 33, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The Lord delivered them into his hands, and he defeated them with a very great slaughter, and the people of Ammon were subdued. And so we look at several things here that we need to see. And the Bible says, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And this is where we begin to get confused because we talked about the spirit of God coming upon Gideon last week. And when you look into this closely, you, you see this man doesn't seem to be godly, doesn't seem to be godlike. He doesn't seem to have the characteristics of a man of God. In fact, he seems the exact opposite. And this is what we need to look at, first of all. God empowered him, but it wasn't like Gideon. He was not clothed and full of the Holy Spirit. God was going to use him for this specific time and this specific task. When you look at this, he wasn't even called by God to do this. There's a big difference. He wasn't even called by God. His half-brothers, the tribe Gilead, called him to come back. And God gave him a temporary empowering to defeat the enemy for the sake of his children, God's children, Israel, for their crying out and repenting. They wanted relief. And the thing is this. And, and, and we see it today, and we can get stuck there sometimes. God at times will do amazing, mighty works of grace and mercy in spite of people for the sake of people. How many hear that today? Did, how many heard that? In spite of this person that may be in rebellion and disobedience and ungodly, but for the sake of the people that are crying out and they want, God, I need you. I repent of my sin and I call upon your name in spite of that one person for the many that need the spirit of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God for that temporary situation God will move because the hearts of the people are crying out to him. And so we look at, God didn't even call Jephthah. It was a human call. And then we see in verse 30, 34 through 39, this ungodly twisted vow by an ungodly man. And so let's look at this. Let's look at this. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, and he said, if you give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. And Jephthah led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about 20 towns from Orer to area near Minnith and as far away as Abel Karim. And in this way, Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returns... Home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. She was his one and only child. He had no other sons or daughters. 
When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out, you have completely destroyed me. You've brought disaster on me, for I've made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. And she said, Father, if you've made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me what you have vowed. For the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies. But first, let me do this one thing. Let me go up and roam in the hills and weep with my friends for two months because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said, and he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills, wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow he had made, and she died of virgin, and she died. He kept the twisted, ungodly vow he made, and he sacrificed his one and only child, his daughter. And we read that, and we think, man. What Game of Thrones episode was that? That is some bad stuff right there. Why did he make this vow? And I got to tell you, and so I began to read again, and sometimes Bible commentators try to soften what takes place here. And this happens sometimes. Well, Jephthah, he, he must have expected an animal to come out first and... The thing is, some people that didn't have means or wealthy enough, they might have had an animal or some animals, livestock in their home. That wasn't the case with Jephthah. Your version may say, who comes out to greet me? An animal isn't coming out to greet you. You know, this says, meet me. Who comes out? He didn't live in that kind of house where there would be animals living in the house. And, yeah, he was thinking human. Or some Bible commentators say, Jephthah really didn't kill his daughter, sacrifice her was symbolic, that she had to stay unmarried the rest of her life, and uh, he didn't expect his daughter. The thought is he expected one of his servants, lowly servants, to greet him first. So why did he make, we come back to it, this ungodly, horrific vow? We've already said he wasn't called by God. We've already said he was ungodly. This is what the pagan culture did to please the pagan gods. You offer sacrifices to please the pagan gods. And the greater the sacrifice, the greater the favor you will earn supposedly from your pagan god. And I'm going to tell you this way, this is not our god, amen? Say, our god's a good god, Amen. This is what he says in Deuteronomy 18.10. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. And this is an outright attempt by Jephthah to negotiate with God and to pay God off. And here's what's happening. Jephthah has mixed in all kinds of foreign chemicals and animal parts into his faith and comes out with something that looks like the meat of faith but it really is not at all. He was desensitized to violence. This is the way they did things. To him, human life was cheap. And once again, Jephthah, as I said, he wasn't godly. So let's look for a moment and stop and think about that. People today, we can commit some similar excesses. Excesses. Okay, how, how do I bring this to 2023? Parents can tear their families apart in a sense we sacrifice them. We can tear our families apart. Spouses can be neglected. Abortions for the sake of choice and convenience, so-called health care. Riots that are destructive and burning and looting and deadly labeled as protest marches. Crimes without consequences. Established laws of protection not enforced. False Narratives pushed as truth. God's word not accepted as absolute truth inspired by God. And we are not as advanced a culture as we think we are. Why did he keep this vow? We could reason that he made it in zeal, but the thing is he waited two months. Then his daughter came back, and then he sacrificed her. He kept it for the same reason he made it. And I want to say this. How how do I make sense of any of this? 
he had no concept of the grace of God. He had no concept of the grace of God, not at all. He lived and he believed a culture where you felt like you had to earn God's favor, that small g. He thought, I have to keep this vow. I have to keep this vow or God's going to punish me. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. He had no concept of the goodness of God, the grace of God, where it tells us, For a grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing I can do, nothing I can do, nothing you can do except believe what Jesus has done and who he is. And Jephthah could have said, God, you never said you'd give me the victory if I make a vow and sacrifice. You never said if I do that, you would give your people victory. You, victory is by your grace and grace alone. It's a gift of grace. He could have said, I repent of making this ungodly vow, Lord. I repent of something. I realize I cannot earn your favor. Lord, I need your grace, and I receive your grace as a free gift. He could have done that, but he's playing the game, let's, let's make a deal with God. I think there's a lot of people still trying to play that game. Let's make a deal. I think maybe some of you this morning might be trying to play that game. Let's make a deal with God. And there's only one deal God will ever make, his righteousness for your absolute surrender to his love, to his life, and to his grace. The pure meat of the gospel and nothing else mixed in 100% pure gospel. Amen? So we look at chapter 12 as we begin to bring this to a close and bring this home. Four lessons right here. Four lessons. Chapter 12, the first seven verses, we look at this, and it says to us, then the people of Ephraim mobilized an army, crossed over the Jordan River. They sent the message to Jephthah. Why didn't you call us to help you fight against the Ammonites? So now there's like a, a little civil war taking place, you know, between tribes, between the children of Israel. Why didn't you call us? And we're going to burn down your house with you in it. Doesn't sound good, does it? Nah. These people are violent. Jephthah replied, I summoned you at the beginning of the dispute, but you refused to come. You failed to help us in our struggle against Ammon. So when I realized you were coming, I risked my life, went to battle without you, and the Lord gave me victory to the Ammonites. So why have you now come to fight me? The people of Ephraim responded, you men of Gilead are nothing more than fugitives from Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and attacked the men of Ephraim and defeated them. Jephthah Capture the salad crossings of the Jordan River wherever the fugitive of Ephraim tried to go back across. Are you a member of the tribe of Ephraim, they would ask. If the man said, no, I'm not, they would tell him to say, Shilabeth. If he was from Ephraim, he would say, Shilabath, because people from Ephraim cannot pronounce the word correctly. Then they would take him, kill him at the shallow crossings of the Jordan, and all, 42,000. Ephraimites were killed at that time. Jephthah judged Israel six years. When he died, he was buried in one of the towns of Gilead. Horrific, unnecessary violence. I want to say this. What did I bring out of that? I said, man, I got to get something out of this, God. We're going to go through the book of Judges. We are far more influenced by our culture than we realize. So I went to Romans chapter 12, the first two verses. The Apostle Paul tells us, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let your bodies be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. With our bodies, our physical bodies. And so God... I don't want to harm what you've given me with gluttony. I don't want to harm what you've given me with drugs. I don't want to harm what you've given me with sexual immorality. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
Jephthah was not just in the culture. The culture was in Jephthah. That's what we're seeing here today. God's called us, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from the ungodly and be separate. God's calling his church to be his church, to be different in the world in which we live. We are to be light in the spiritual darkness. We are to speak truth into the untruth of our world today, and if all we can do is be light behind these four walls and speak up behind these four walls, we are going to make a difference in our culture whatsoever. God's calling his church today. Amen. Come on. The culture is getting into the church we don't have to think like this world, act like this world. We, we don't have to buy what the world buys. We don't have to be pressured like people are pressured today. Man, there's peer pressure big time. There's peer pressure on our teens, on our students, on those that are in college. And I said to the men yesterday in Bible study, and it doesn't stop when you're an adult. We need to think like that, act like that, do like that. No, we don't. We're different. We're the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're better than that, amen? That's not condescending and then that's judging, but we're better because we've been purchased by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're saved for more. We're saved for so much more, so much more. So we need to know the word of God. You see, he ends up with a concoction of faith that wasn't pure. It was a hot dog and not a steak. I'm going for the steak this morning. How about you? We need to know God's word. We need the Holy Spirit to work in us. And then we see our idolatry has devastating effects. The impurity of Jephthah's faith, it cost so many people and especially his daughter. We look at our students. I said something about young people, teens. We look at our students, high school, college. When we look at them, they have little defense against increasing pressure and the confusion and the despair. And I think, where has the church been in speaking the truth? Man, I, I was in church as a young teenager when Roe v. Wade was passed. I was in a good church, but my church never addressed this topic, never said anything about it. We didn't know what was going on because the church was silent. There's things happening today in America and our culture, and let me tell you, people would like us to be silent. And the church in America is even divided, thinking we should be silent. And you can speak and say all you want to right here, but God's called us to go into this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives, changes lives. And so we look at our young people, and there's confusion and despair and brokenness, and, and we, we, we need to take this seriously. We need to speak truth. We are not as sophisticated as we think we are in America. So I look at abortions in Pennsylvania. The recent stats come from the year 2020. In Montgomery County, 989. Bucks County, 885. Lehigh, 1,479. In Philadelphia, 13,197, and I say that, yeah, there's babies that should be here, but I say also there are women, and some of them are realizing what's happened, and they're living in guilt and shame and brokenness, and they need to know the healer, Jesus Christ. Drug overdoses in PA in 2021, 5,168. Last year in America, over 1 million fentanyl overdoses. 22.8% of all Americans, nearly one quarter answer, none on surveys inquiring about religious affiliation. Over one third, 35% of U.S. teens reported suicidal thoughts in the last three months unacceptable. It reported 45% of teens in the U.S. believe that all religions teach equally valid truths. But I want to say right now, 
but Jesus. Oh, say it with me, but Jesus. We're going to take a look at this picture right here. You don't have that picture. Uh, that's disappointing. The picture is of our teenagers, their retreat last weekend. There were two saved, two ready to rededicated their lives to Jesus Christ. And all 65 students brought their Bibles. But Jesus, amen, every Wednesday night, what, what Mike Kubis and God used him to put in motion Quincy and his team is continuing every Wednesday night between 90 and 100 teenagers showing up for youth ministry. Somebody say praise God. Amen. God's grace is a hard thing to, to get a hold of because uh, so many of us, if I just do a little bit more, if I just do a little bit more, you know, it, it's a little bit harder for us to surrender our will and God's will to come into our lives. It's still, if I just work a little bit, even when we get saved, we can fall into that trap. Even when I'm born again, I just maybe have to work a little bit more and earn the favor of God and the blessing of God and the goodness of God. How many's fallen into that trap sometimes? Come on. Okay, I, I, am I the only one? Come on, how many's fall in that? I'm gonna tell you, I fight that on a regular basis. It's the grace of God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God. If I will surrender and allow him to be God in my life, that's when God things begin to happen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It. Religion says do, but it's never done. The gospel says believe, and it's already done. I said it last week. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything. We need a better judge, a deliverer, a savior. Well, like Jephthah, Jesus was driven from his brother, so to speak. The word says he was despised and rejected by men. But unlike Jephthah, we didn't have to call him back to help us. Jesus came running back to save us. The word says at just the right time. His timing is perfect. When he came to this earth, when he was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life. And it says at just the right time, he showed up in your life. And just the right time, he showed up in my life. And at just the right time, when I need help in my time of trouble, he shows up at just the right time. He's a perfect hero, deliverer, savior. Thank you, Jesus. Jephthah tried diplomacy. It didn't work. Jesus Christ came teaching and preaching. But he always had a plan. Jephthah had to turn to war. Jesus turned the war on himself, and he went to the cross, and he laid down his life for you and me, and he gave his life away willingly. No one took his life. No one murdered him. He laid it down as a sacrifice, perfect for you and me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, the perfect Savior, he was broken for our brokenness. So I want to tell you today, I want to encourage you today, I want to challenge you today, plead with you today with this little phrase that is kind of humorous and kind of stupid. Put down your hot dog. Put down your hot dog and receive 100% pure gospel of Jesus Christ today. The best that God has for you. Stop digging for wells of water that will never satisfy and drink from the river of life freely. It's not that hard. We make it harder. It's not confusing. We make it confusing. Jesus is here right now. How many would say in your heart, in your soul, I'm thirsty right now? I'm thirsty. Come on, let's be honest. I'm thirsty. He has, 
He's the well that never runs dry because we get saved, we're born again. And, and not that we get unsaved and we're not born again, but the thing is, we're humans and we're living this life and, and we get thirsty and we can keep going back to the spiritual well where there's an endless supply that will never, ever run out. I'm going to drink from the well of everlasting life. I'm going to drink from the well of everlasting life. I'm going to drink from the well that refreshes. I'm going to drink from the well that energizes. I am thirsty today. I need the drink that only Jesus Christ can give me this morning. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. If you're here this morning, I want to ask you this question. Is Jesus Christ your Lord, your Savior, your friend, the King of your life? If you can't say automatically, just, just that fast, yes, he is, yes, he is, yes, he is, that probably means he's not really. You need the life that only he can give you. You need to go to him, the river of living water. Stop digging wells, the wrong wells that will never satisfy. And come to the well, the river of living water, Jesus himself this morning. It's time to take a drink. That's why the word says, taste and see the Lord is good. Just take that one drink and say, yeah, this is it. This is it right here. This is him. This is who I've been looking for. This is what I've been longing for. I didn't think so, but yeah, it's Jesus. If you don't know Christ this morning, but you want to know him, that's simple. Raise your hand with me and say, yes, I want to know Jesus. I need Jesus. Today, I'm going to accept him as my Savior. Today, I'm going to allow him to take my sin and give me his life and be what the Bible says, born again. He's here. So that's why I take a moment every Sunday to give that invitation. We thank you, Lord. If you do do that, we just had this happen last week, the week before. We didn't think anybody raised their hand, and there were like three cards turned in we saw on a Monday morning that we rejoiced over. So that card there, you can turn it in, take it to the next step and say, today, I received Christ. As we go to the Lord's table this morning in communion, if you would like to receive communion, recognizing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you don't have the elements, raise your hand. The gentlemen are right here, and raise your hand over here, over here, over here on this side. Just keep your hand raised. They'll come to you over here. You see, this juice represents his perfect, precious, sinless blood. The only thing that can take away our sin and give us new life. This wafer represents his body that was beaten and tortured and nailed to the cross. so we could be whole. Is anybody watching uh, the, the series, The Chosen? Anybody watching The Chosen? Come on. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. There, there's so many things we could bring out, but you begin to see the personalities. They're people like we're people, but they say shalom, shalom. That's Jewish. They say why peace, 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 and then perfect peace wholeness. He's come to make us whole. Broken for our brokenness. We're not going to be perfect people on planet earth, but I don't have to live a broken life any longer through Jesus Christ. I'm whole. Thank you, Lord. On the night Jesus was betrayed before he went to the cross with his followers, disciples. He showed them what this means. They ate the Passover meal, and then he instituted communion, the Lord's Supper. 
And he took the bread and he gave thanks, and we give you thanks. There is none like you. We are grateful. We are thankful. That for the joy that set before you, you endured the cross and the shame and the suffering. And that joy was salvation. That joy was each and every one of us. That you took my sin, all of our sins. And you suffered under the weight of that sin. You who knew no sin became sin for each and every one of us. We are grateful this morning. We worship you. And we receive in faith and expectancy. If you have a need in your life, you have a hurt in your life, a wound in your life, something that you're carrying that, that's heavy right now, as we receive this wafer together, let's believe for healing. Thank you, Lord. We receive. And Lord, we thank you for the cup that represents your precious blood. Thank you for cleansing. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for freedom. Thank you that you make me whole. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. 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 Do you love Jesus this morning, church? Come on, do you love him this morning? Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Let's stand together to worship. If you have a need in your life, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. If you'd stand here, front, off to the side, whatever. But if you have a need in your life, oh, don't leave here today without us agreeing with you, praying the prayer of faith, and seeing God move in your life. Let the Lord encourage you through prayer this morning. Let's worship. <laughs>